Hello everyone, uh, this is kind of a new thing I'm doing, but uh, I this is something I've been wanting to do for quite a while now, and uh, but just never had the time to. So uh, today, this is uh, kind of the first episode of the Autumn Colors podcast, and today I wanted to talk about something that more or less has been on my mind and on uh, a few of my friends' mind. Uh, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl, the remastered remake, re whatever, to the beloved Gen 4 Pokemon game. And today I brought a very special guest with me, an artist who has made some really wonderful art and also made my profile picture for my channel, and also is a longtime lover of Pokemon Dreamer. If you want to say hi. Hi. <laughs> Alright, so, uh, this is a little new, so, but, uh, I, I brought you on here because, well, one, you're one of the bigger Pokemon fans I'm friends with, and two, like, aside from a few other people, you're one of the few people who I think I can hold legitimate conversation with, and it not feel weird because a lot of other people don't really know what kind of person I am outside of, like, online and server, and I think you're one of the few. So yeah, so pretty much we're gonna get warned and whatnot, but if there's a at any point, like, I doubt it, but if there's any point there's like a question or something, a topic or whatnot that you just don't feel comfortable with, you don't know how to answer, or you just uh, don't feel like answering, you can ask if, if you want to skip it. It's perfectly fine. Oh, of course, of course. All right, so first things first, uh, how has your, how's your month been? Oh, my month's been actually really tiring, to be honest. I mean, it's, like, it's been a test, highs and lows. Had a little bit of a vacation, and then I'm back, and then it's finals week. Yeah, but, you know, it's probably going to end off on a very high note, so. Yeah. Uh, like, I work in a warehouse, so uh, pretty much my week has been, my month has been packed because a lot of people have been ordering back and forth. <laughs> So I've been love tired. Amazon delivery. Yeah, I've I've been trying to cope with just binging stuff. Like I've been binging One Piece recently. Seems like I'm not. It seems like I know two people now that are binging One Piece. <laughs> I've got. I haven't really done much with um, binging anything, honestly. I mean, I got my fix with Brilliant with Shining Pearl, um, and didn't really have much to do, honestly. But I'm I'm getting back there somehow. Pretty much like I work a 10 hour job, so it's like I, I really, I just, I'm pretty much there with my thoughts. So just 10 hours every day for five days and just that much time to watch like long term stuff like One Piece. It's just, it's been pretty nice. It's kind of nice that you actually don't have to worry about like wondering if the people that you're working for don't end up injur injuring themselves, you know? Because that's yeah. pretty much the nature of my job. So, you know, you always got to make sure that these people are not trying to kill themselves in one way or another. Yeah, you got to make that money somehow. I know. At least it does pay well, so I'm not too upset. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. And so, on to the topic of uh, Pokemon, more or less. Uh, just out of curiosity, like, uh, if you want to talk about it, how did you get into Pokemon? And, do you, like, what do you like about it? And possibly, what do you dislike about it? Well, all right, I'll start with the history. I was four or five years old, actually, when I got into Pokemon. It was really my uncle who was living with us at the time. He had just got me, like, a Game Boy Advance SP, and he got me two games. He got me the Donkey Kong Country game, and then he got me Pokemon Silver. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot more hours on Pokemon Silver. I just was... It, I was just encapsulated with the idea of like, oh, you get to catch these cute little monsters and they fight for you and you're basically on a journey. And I was like, oh, that's actually kind of cool because I was a very sheltered kid. So I'm just like, okay, so this idea of like traveling the world with your cute, fuzzy companions and I'm, it, it, it was just heaven for me, honestly. That's... I didn't get into the anime until like much later in life because from what I realized the anime only aired on Saturdays and we're Seventh Day Adventists so we don't really do anything on Saturdays aside from go to church and they always tell me not to turn on the TV until sunset so I was never able to watch the Saturday morning cartoons but when I had my first computer which was like a laptop um, I was able to look up 
random episodes of Pokemon anime and I just watched it from there. And I had internet literacy at a very young age, so I was just able to look up and read about the episodes. And I ended up watching the movies instead. And from then on, I just became overall addicted to Pokemon. It's still like that to this day. Even my parents kind of like are worried about my mental sanity, but I swear I'm fine. That's that's very nice. Uh, and uh, possibly like any like anything you really like about this series, I I guess I kind of wrapped around back to what you just talked about. Where like anything you really like or anything you really dislike about it, or are you just kind of alright with it. I find very few dislikes, contrary to like a lot of popular belief, because like, you know, nowadays there are so many Pokemon fans who are just like, oh, the new remakes suck, oh, Pokemon isn't trying anymore, this and that, they're just finding every reason to complain, and now there's a new thing going on on Twitter where they actually bash the older games and oh, praise the newer ones really? instead. Like, people are like, oh, Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl is actually one of the better remakes of the series, and a remake like Heart Gold and Soul Silver is now considered trash because they didn't fix some of the problems that Johto had. Which I, I mean, I don't say that it's trash because, like, I, I started with Johto, so it actually holds a special place in my heart. But yeah. at the same time, replaying it as an adult now, I realize that, yeah, Johto has a lot of flaws. There's the leveling curve. You don't have as many of the new Pokemon as abundant as you should. You introduce a new type and then you can't even get like most Pokemon of the new type until after you beat the main story. So that was always a problem that I have with um, Gen 2. And Harville and Zillsilver didn't really fix that as well either. They kind of just like boosted the levels just a little bit, but the leveling curve was still there and there was still the prevalent problem of, oh, you can't really find the new dark type Pokemon until you go to Kanto. Because like they trying to advertise that the only new dark type that you can get was an Umbreon, or you can get very early as an Eevee. Which I believe was a little bit lame, but at least Harko and Soul Silver fixed that you can actually get the pseudo legend of that game, Larvitar, very early at least, rather than going all the way to the very end of the game before you fight Red. So yeah. I was okay with that, but that was like one of my main problems with it. But despite that, I still enjoy playing every new game whenever I can. Like, I, I try not to, I don't hold like anyone's like opinion about the new games. Um, too close to heart anyway. I just do it by myself. I just play it. I have fun and I'm happy Yeah, that's that's really nice um, Personally for me uh, like I Got into Pokemon uh, at a I got in Pokemon at a young age also like mostly uh, Well, my parent well my family was kind of broke so pretty much we had like one Game Boy Color and a copy of Pokemon Red and we made that shit last like I, I remember, like, just nights out on the couch, just with the light on and just playing through Pokemon Red and being it for, like, the 50th time. And just, like, and going through, like, my seventh pack of AA batteries. <laughs> and honestly, like, uh, it, it just continued on from there. I did watch, like, the Saturday morning cartoons and whatnot, but it's, like... I wasn't really there for that. Like I, I, I kind of watched them and whatnot, and like I, I remember the intro of the the iconic intro of Pokemon very well. But like, I mean, ultimately, I was I was in it for the games, and I, I, because I really enjoyed like playing through them and whatnot instead of like kind of watching uh and at, uh, watching more or less kind of a uh, marketing adaptation of what I was supposed to be doing. And whatnot. That's kind of how I took it back then. Um, I was it's kind of been up and down with Pokemon. Like the, again, I was broke, so there were games I couldn't be able to buy and whatnot. Um, I I never was able to play like Fire Red, Leaf Green when I was growing up. I never got to play. Uh, I never got to really like play Gold and Silver. Like I never got to buy those games. And like, but. Around the time when I learned about emulation and whatnot, and my Game Boy Color died, I I learned about uh, all these different games. So I got to play like uh, I got to play some other hacked mods and whatnot of certain games. But I got to uh, I got to play Gold and Silver. I got to play Ruby Sapphire and Emerald. I got to play uh, the Fire Red Leaf Green games, and around like uh the when i got actually got a, a nintendo ds the one of the first things i got was pokemon uh heart gold and soul silver 
but uh, sometime, I don't remember what happened to it, but at this point, I'm just gonna chalk it up to sometime one of my parents uh, saw that, like, my games were kind of a hindrance on my education and whatnot, so they either threw it out or sold them for whatever, and I'm, my money's kind of on they sold them off, because, uh, like, I was kind of flaky in school, but at the same time, like, I was, I had, I, at that point, I wasn't really concerned with school, so I lost my copy of Heart Gold really quickly, and that made me sad. But that's a whole mood, honestly. Like my parents had something similar, where they're like, "Okay, yeah, I, I do play a lot of video games, and it was a hindrance on my education at several points." So they didn't really sell them off outright, at the very least, even though they were kind of like. This was like during the early days when people were like, oh, Pokemon is satanic and things like that. And my dad can't really stop me from like playing the games because I did enjoy playing the games. And every time I did well, I would always ask like either my mom or even my godfather to like, oh, can you buy me this new Pokemon game, please, please, please? And you know, they, they kind of relented. I was very spoiled back then. So I was like, I, I got the world essentially. So they just, what they really did was just, they just took my DS or my Game Boy and didn't give it back to me until my grades started to improve. That's kind of what my dad did. They don't did. do that anymore since I'm 22, so it, that's really all on me. They just give me really harsh scoldings and stuff, but that's it. They can't really take my stuff away because now I buy my own stuff, so yeah, they same. can't really take it because it belong to them. Yeah, like, I, my dad used to take away, like, my PSP and my Nintendo 3DS, and it's like, when you learn, when you, when your grades start improving or whatnot, you'll get them back, and then now, it's basically like, I, now, basically, like, he doesn't really have any excuse, because, like, I, I bought my own Nintendo Switch, I bought my own PS4, and, like, literally, what is he gonna do if, like, say, I'm, I'm kind of fucking up and whatnot, he can't take that shit away, I own Judge it. Me. He'll judge you, that's what it does. So that's what, exactly what my dad does. He's like, you're 22, you're in college, you shouldn't be playing all these kid games, you know? Oh my god. And, so, but yeah, after a while, like, I didn't, I, I, unfortunately, um, again, like, we were, I couldn't get into the DS, I couldn't get into the DS series, so I never got a chance to play, like, black and white. I never got a chance to get uh more i didn't get a chance to like i had like diamond and pearl but that was along with uh heart gold and soul silver my i think one of my parents sold that off so yeah and then when i got a 3ds the first game i i when i finally got a 3ds the first game i ever bought was pokemon x and y and like i know a lot of people give it a criticism and whatnot but i don't care like that game I loved it. It was, I had so many good memories playing with it, like just in high school and during lunch or after school and whatnot, just getting together with a bunch of my friends and we would just duke it out and everything or trade. I loved it. And I also loved, even though I came in too late with it, I love the, uh, the anniversary event they were doing where they were giving out like legendaries and mythicals. I love that. And yeah. I, like, I, the same thing, too. Like, I got it on Black Friday, so I was like, oh, yeah, I really want the new Pokemon game that came out. And I, I absolutely love it, too. Like, looking back at it now, yeah, it kind of aged a little bit, like, in terms of, like, the story and the content that you can get. But I still enjoy every Pokemon game. Like, I always made it, like, I guess you can say a mission to make sure to get as get all the new games as early as possible so it's like i'm kind of grateful for like gamestop when they have the buy now pay later option where you can just pay it every two, pay like a quarter of it every two weeks so i'm just able to discreetly buy the games that i want so it's just like excuse me it's just like um okay so shining pearl i wasn't able i was i wasn't able to secure the pre-order initially because um i had like a little bit of money over time but then i remembered that gamestop had that buy now pay later option so i decided to just buy that the day before the game came out and then the, the next day at noon i had my copy and i was well ends well although i do kind of regret playing it when i was supposed to be taking like quizzes and stuff and i actually missed a couple of quizzes because i was so enthralled with playing bdsp yeah and then with x and y like um i suppose like with X and Y, like, I, one thing that really captivated me was, like, it's, contrary to popular belief, it was not the mega evolution, it was the customization, because I loved to dress my character as such and whatnot, it really made me feel like, I, it, it really made me feel like I could be in the Pokemon world with that, because, like, I, I like 
the idea of them like putting in like oh this is a specific trainer that you get to play as and whatnot that's fine but I also like to uh, like it have more of an identity with my game and whatnot when with the customization and everything and the second thing I really enjoyed was and again I don't know if this was in Pokemon uh, like the the generation before it but I I really liked Pokemon refresh or a me in that game where you could just spend little time with uh, your favorite Pokemon and whatnot pet them, give them cupcakes, and play games with them and everything. I really thought that was really cute, and I loved it. I guess it's because I had a hyperactive imagination as a kid, so, like, I never really saw, like... I mean, yeah, the character customization is, like, by far the best addition that Pokemon had ever given us, honestly. The idea that you can... This is now you as a character. Like, you can actually dress them up. Even... It's down to, like, even hell. You can have skin tones of your... You're, like, your identical or near-identical skin tone. We got it for you. And they have, like, all these nice little outfits that you can dress up the trainer in. And, uh, yeah, I really like that a lot. Like, but because I had, like, a hyperactive imagination as a kid, I never really saw myself as the, you know, the Avatar character they would give you in the previous generations. I literally just saw myself in them, as them, just wearing their outfits or whatever. Even when it was, like, back in Red and Blue or Gold and Silver, when you only played as a male character, I just kind of interpreted the character as gender ambiguous. So it was easier for me to just kind of say, okay, this is technically me. I'm just wearing a vest, a shirt. I'm basically doing my off-brand Ash Ketchum cosplay. Kind of like, uh, like I, I guess in terms of Jenny Big, it's kind of like uh, Yellow from Pokemon Adventures. Yeah. I really love the manga, by the way, too. Like, I oh, think yeah. the manga is like, one of the best like renditions of the Pokemon franchise, to be honest, because it actually is not afraid to actually get into like the dark, gritty side of Pokemon oh, yeah. that he doesn't really like to do sometimes. Because, like, that's one of my flaws with the anime. I actually shouldn't... I forgot to go back to the dislikes. Like, the anime is great in the sense that, hey, if you're not able to play the games, maybe you can just watch the series about a kid who's just like you, going on a journey to be the best Pokemon trainer that there ever is. And then he has his friends alongside, which kind of boiled that aspect that I want to do that, you know? Like, I want to have an adventure with my friends and be the best Pokemon trainer, too. That's cool. But, like, I, I guess you could say that it's it's... We're nearing 2022, and I'm actually genuinely tired of Ash. That's why I really love, like, the side series, like, Generations or Evolutions. Or even, like, the side specials, like, the, um, the Legend of Thunder special, or even Pokemon Chronicles. Because, like, you finally have the chance to actually give other characters, aside from Ash, the spotlight. What are they doing while Ash is away and things like that? Yeah, I have to. So I really enjoy that. I really enjoy that. Because, like, we're, we're tired of Ash. He doesn't grow up. He doesn't learn from his mistakes half of the time. It seems like that every generation, there's always going to be like a new um, strategy or new writers to actually give him some semblance of a personality without any like resemblance to the previous generation, which made me understand why people did not like Sun and Moon because it was such like a huge, I guess you could say, distance from the writing of x and y it, it feels That's like a it feels like some writers from final fantasy came in and took over i i mean yeah to be honest yeah it's kind of like that actually and i honestly did not mind that at all like i thought that x and y was actually a pretty good season hell i really think that i think aside from x and y i think ash's best rendition was his was the diamond and pearl arc I also still feel he was extremely cheated of his victory because we just pull up with a kid with an action replay and legendaries coming to wipe the floor with him. That was probably the cheesiest way for them to have made him lose, to be honest. Yeah. Actually, I take it back. The cheesiest way was the black and white saga. They really made him lose to a kid with only five Pokemon. Oh, yeah. Who then ended up getting his cheeks clapped by an evolution trainer. Like, the Pokemon anime, the, like, I'm, I'm so-and-so about it. Like, the one thing I really like in terms of recent Pokemon anime is, like, one of the... I, I don't remember if it was... I think it was centered on black and white and whatnot, but it was the episode where they introduced Meloetta. And as such, they they uh, had Dawn come back as a nerd character, and they had this whole reunion and whatnot. One thing I loved out of that episode was just how much of a, how much of a beast, like, Piplup was against Oshawata. <laughs> because Piplup is just hanging out, having some fun with Metaletta, and he just has this smug look he gives Oshawata. 
Oh yeah, but Ash, uh, yeah, Pimplup was always a simp back in the Diamond and Pearl Saga, and I remember that clearly well, honestly. Fun fact, I actually thought Piplup was a girl because of the fact that he did wear a cheerleader's outfit, initially. I, I was like, that's that's a little girl, honestly. That's a little girl. I think it's a cute little girl. The episode when they were dealing with a female Togepi that was actually trying to fly a rocket to the freaking um, stratosphere and fight Rayquaza. Nah, your Togepi's, I mean, your Piplup is a boy. What? What? And it made me laugh because, like, I think that it was, like, during that midpoint of um, Diamond and Pearl is when they started to actually give Pokemon their characteristics more and more, like their gender and things like that. Which was actually kind of funny because that same episode had revealed that Jesse's young Mega was actually a girl all along. And Jesse's like, you're a girl? And uh, young Mega was just blushing and, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think that's what I really liked when they started actually diverting like, hey, listen, Pokemon are literally no different from us. They have genders, they have their own personality traits, you know, we want to employ that more and more. And then Black and White kind of like gave us more and more um, Pokemon with their own gender traits. Like, if I recall correctly, I think almost every one of Ash's Pokemon had a set gender. I think the only exception was his Voldor, but like literally out of like the nine or ten Pokemon that Ash had, I think only two of them were female. And he just spam. This was the generation that he was spamming a tract from Snivy, like, like it was nothing. So you actually would actually he was actually using some kind of strategy or whatnot, like probably using a tract to like you know determine if a Pokemon is male or female, and then gaining the upper hand. Yeah, but it's one of those little details that I really appreciate Black and White for, like. I know a lot of people don't like black and white because of the tonal dissonance. The fact that Ash got his cheeks clapped to a level 5 Snivy that had never fought before <laughs> after his Pikachu just went toe to toe with the Latios, although we kind of blame the writers for letting Zekrom just slurp up Pikachu's electricity just like that. And then people didn't really like um, Iris and Silent because they were basically the great value version of Misty and Brock. I actually liked Iris a lot more than Silent. I used to like Silent more because I actually thought he was very sweet and kind, but then looking back at it, I actually like Iris more because she actually had more personality than Silent. Silent was just like, there. He was a connoisseur and we're like, okay, what do connoisseurs do? They evaluate things, they're basically legal critics. And um, he had a fear of purloin for some undisclosed <laughs> reason. Like they never actually went into the fact why he had a fear of purloin. I was thinking it could be some kind of traumatic incident with a purloin, which made sense, but they never really explained to that. Because, like, Misty apparently had a fear of Gyarados because she almost crawled into one's mouth as a baby. That made sense. May did not like Pokemon at all because she was mistaken for one when she was little and her mom actually tried to catch her when she was surrounded by a bunch of tentacle and cried for help. That made sense. But Silent having a fear of a little cat Pokemon why that never made sense to me like at all yeah at the very least you could have done something like oh he's allergic to cat he's allergic to purloins and like at the very least like that would have made some that could have made some sense i don't know how you would do that but just like it yeah it could have made something it could have made something and maybe he was a, a, a evasive purloin because maybe he had an allergy that would actually have made sense honestly he doesn't want to trigger his allergies or maybe it could have been that maybe he actually liked purloin but the allergies are what set him back from them because that reminded me of a character in persona 2 eternal punishment um uh crap i forgot his name to be honest but he was tatsuya's older brother oh it was katsuya um katsuya apparently loved cats he had an allergy to cats a bad one at that like a, the minute a cat comes up to him, he starts sneezing uncontrollably. And that's kind of sad. Life really t told you, fuck you, you're going to have a cat allergy, even though you're a cat lover. Yeah. I the get... ultimate L. Yeah, but pretty much, uh, I want to kind of keep this moving on. But uh, pretty much, uh, like, in terms of, like, the anime, I think, like, I don't, I, I kind of stop paying attention to, like, the main anime, because I'm kind of with you, I'm not really interested in Ash anymore. Maybe back in the day when it was, like, you know, the adventures of Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh, yeah, but we're, like, it's kind of the point where it's now, like, I want to kind of focus on other characters, like, I want, like, I liked Pokemon Twilight Wings for this, because it's centered on other characters in Sword and Shield, but in terms and of- And life, too. Yeah. Not to mention that I gave the Gala region life, which we didn't really see in other regions. Like, all right, so we just have all of these other regions. And I think the most 
the other most lore heavy like regions in Pokemon has to be Johto because they kind of based it off of like really old Japan with their ties to history and how it still reflects on modern day culture and stuff. Yeah. So I really like that. And then there was Sinnoh who also had like a lore heavy shit idea with the whole lore of Dialga and Palkia and stuff. And there are characters who are over very interested in the Sinnoh lore, which made sense. And then there's Unova who were basically like, this is modern Pokemon, modern times. Like maybe the history is not there anymore and there's people still his studying the history, but people are with the times. There are things that reflect the modern time back when it was released. And honestly, like my may get like a bit of hate right now, but Unova actually was one of my favorite regions. Like I think it's in my top three of favorite regions solely because it's based on New York and I live in New York. So I'm like, if I was in the Pokemon world, this is where I'm from. I get you. First, and um, as for the newer generations, like, okay, so I know a lot of people on the internet just fucking, like, have it out for this game and whatnot, but I don't care. I love Pokemon Sword and Shield. Like, okay, it's not, like, okay, I will say this, it, like, in terms of, like, you know, writing and story, yeah, it's not the best, but I mean, like, I, like, it, it gave me, like, ultimately... And I, I've heard our people, such as Mighty Keith, say this, and ultimately I'm in agreement with this, where it's like, you know, in terms of, like, what I like and dislike about it, like, it's very low. Like, in terms of, like, it, like if I say, like, if I had to dislike something, it would also be, like, some minor nitpicks and stuff. But in terms of, like, like I have a lot of, I, I like about the Pokemon games, both in the past and present and going on the future. And, and the the reason why is because, like, I, I've i kept my expectations very, like, low. Because, like, I, I've learned, not just with Pokemon, but with other games as well, and media and whatnot, if I have my expectations set high, I'm setting myself up for disappointment. If I keep myself low, when something happens that precedes those low expectations, that keeps me happy and that keeps me excited. That's why I like... That's why I ultimately liked games like, uh... This, that's ultimately why I liked uh, Sword and Shield, is that my expectations were set low. Like, I expected, like, the usual, the usual stuff I've gotten out of Pokemon uh, over the past years. But when I found out that, oh, like, we're intru we're introducing, like, these Dynamaxing, and we're, uh, we're also... We also have, like, a lot of these other areas, like the Io of Armor and the Crown Tundra, and we're having these other uh, forms of battle and everything... When I found out about that, I was like, oh, that's that's actually really nice. I like that. And then there's some other stuff from Sword and Shield that I really like. And also, in terms of, like, stuff that I think is controversial, but kind of... Because I know a lot of people that hate this character, and, like, I love him. I love Hop. Like, Hop is one of my favorite characters. I actually really like Hop, too. Not just as a rival, but as a character. I felt like people were like, oh, he's just basically a ripoff of Hal. I think Hal ran so Hop could walk in that sense. Cause yeah. Hop, Hal, the rivals were always like a kind of a hit or miss, in my opinion. Because like, all right, so your first two rivals are basically jerks. And they're just like, okay, you really want to beat the shit out of them. And yeah. then they basically didn't really do nothing for the Ruby Sapphire rivals. Like, you have the opposite sex character who is just basically the assistant to the professor, and the, yeah. that's it. And then you have Wally, who I think would have been a much more interesting rival to actually battle more than just, you know, the opposite sex character. Because, like, okay, there's this kid, he basically has asthma, and he's just trying to be a little bit stronger physically and mentally. And you... you you respect that hustle. I respect the um, zero to hero ordeal. And I really love the fact that they kind of characterized him more in Oraz. And instead of a Gardevoir, they gave him a Gallade, which would would actually made it more sense because, you know, we already had a character whose ace Pokemon was Gardevoir by then. So giving him the other um, uh, evolution of Ralts was pretty great. And I'm going to be honest, I'm actually more biased for Gallade than Gardevoir now. I've, I've grown tired of Gardevoir. Like, it's I not even that. because of, like, the whole... It's not even because of the whole R34 or anything of like that. I used to like Gardevoir, too, because I back then when I was a girl, a little girl, I, I always really liked the cute, girly Pokemon. And what is Gardevoir? A very pretty, girly Pokemon. 
I made sure to get myself a female Ralts and everything. I made her so pretty. But like over time, I've actually grown tired of Gardevoir mainly because it's just a lot more popular and stuff. But like I still like Gardevoir, but like not as much as I like Gallade because I like Gallade's whole idea of being like this honorable, chivalrous knight and stuff. And like Mega Gallade is actually really fucking sick. It gets a oh, cape yeah. and stuff. It looks like a hero. And I actually do vibe with Gallade a lot more. Like I will literally like use Gallade in like any Sinnoh run that I go through. Like, even now, I beat the game, actually. Gallade was actually in my final team, so I vibed with it a lot. Not to mention, it's very useful for catching Pokemon. It's like, oh, yeah. it's a Swiss Army knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, like, um, in turn, going back to how, like, the one, I, I, I don't necessarily like how, mainly because I felt he was very one-dimensional. Yeah, and, he's a very, very flat character. Like, like he, okay. like you see him getting beaten by, um, I forget his Gladian. name. Gladian. Gladian. Yes, you get to see him getting beat by Gladian, and he's like, "Ah, oh, well, that's a shame. I guess I'll have to try again." And then you go. Even Gladian calls him out on that. Like, like bro, are you even trying? <laughs> yeah. Then cut over to Hop, where he gets beaten by Bede, and where he's like, "God, mm -hmm. ah, I need to get stronger. Why can't I beat him? Why can't I? I need to be the best." And he and I, I like his story because he goes through this whole thing of he wants to be like his brother he wants to be the best and he keeps losing over and over and he keeps wondering why do i why does this keep happening and eventually as the events unroll it's like you know what i don't care that i'm not the best anymore i'm gonna let the main character have that. i'm gonna let the i'm gonna let you i'm gonna let the trainer have that but you know what i'm still gonna reach to my own heights i'm gonna find my own Goal. I'm gonna strive to achieve my own dreams with Pokemon and I'm going to do this with Wulu and I'm going to I'm going to be my own best I'm going to strive to do my own best and I like that because it was shaping him from being like oh you know what I'm going to be as cool as my brother do you know what I'm going to be the best me that I can ever be I respect that too, but like, okay, there's actually two things with between like Hop and Hal. So in the case of Hal, yeah, he's a very flat character in the sense that, okay, he loses a lot and like he basically doesn't care. His whole dream is to basically become the Kahuna, like his uncle, like his grandpa, and it's like, okay, that that's it. That's all he does. So it doesn't care if he wins or loses because considering the fact that you beat his grandfather before him, it makes sense because you know this is gonna be him when he gets older. So I think he's understood to accept losses when they are, but he does actually managed to improve himself a lot better and that's why i actually really like ultra sun and ultra moon how they characterize him because while he still remains the same he still has his like character traits and whatnot mm. um but he also does actually go through a small amount of metamorphosis and not to mention his team is actually pretty stacked like he has the starter and then he has a bunch of other pokemon like tauros yeah. as a commemoration for the ride tauros he has an evolution that's strong against your starter and then like he even has like pokemon like Noivern and stuff and you're just like what the hell where'd you get these from and the Alolan Raichu too. No, don't forget that. Yeah. Yes, but with Hop, uh, with Hop on the other hand, like Hop, that's why I really liked Hop's characterization. Cause like, okay, he kind of starts off a little bit cocky, and he's like, okay, my brother's the best. I, I'm gonna be just like my brother. I'm gonna beat my brother and stuff. And then he gets curb stomped by Bead and. Not only did he get curb stomped because that doesn't really affect him as much because he loses to you a bunch of times, but it's Bead literally shitting on him and telling him, you really aren't shit compared to your brother. You're probably just dragging his name. That's what gave Hop that, like, that depressive arc because it makes him genuinely think that he's actually literally nothing but shit that, you know, is dragging his brother's name down. And what made it even more interesting was that it actually reflects through his team because like yeah his first pokemon was wulu but then you see after that this next subsequent battles against hop you see that he doesn't have his wulu anymore and you're just like what the fuck hop where's your wulu that's your best friend isn't that my man's really just benched his best friend because he wants to be stronger and he's experimenting with these different teams the until he finds his perfect team and then like probably like the second to last time before you battle him again you see that his wulu which is now a double is back on the team in the forefront which is very, very good visual yeah. um, storytelling. So, like, like him or hate him, you can't deny that Hop actually has really good visual storytelling. Yeah. He goes from this cocky little kid who's like, okay, I'm going to be the best, to having his depressive arc and then trying to see what works for him. And then he's a lot more humble, but he's more sure of himself. Which is also why you really like when you fight him in, um, in the Champion Cup 
he actually has a special animation after you beat him. But the one thing I really did not like post-game was the fact that, okay, he's evolved from I want to be the champion to I'm going to be a Pokemon professor. That felt a little sudden, in my opinion. Because maybe this kind of thing should have came like during the adventure too. Maybe he wants to explore other options during the game. But this only happens while you're helping the other gym leaders. I felt like they should have at least kept him wanting to stay being your rival and wanting to be the champion after you upsurped Leon. Because now that's like, now you're the new biggest rival that he has to overcomplicate, overachieve. And he can probably be a helper to Sonya at the same time. Like, they could have done that. Yeah. And like, um, a little, a little just kind of add on to that. I think that's, uh, I think a part of that whole thing of like, kind of, you know, there should have expanded a little more on, uh, him in terms of like him going from, I want to be the champion to, I want to be a Pokemon professor. I think it's kind of, uh, like that type of characterization, that little more exploration with his character. I think it's a big part of why I like Shauna from X and Y. Is because like she ultimately she doesn't really play the part of the rival she doesn't play the part of like oh I want to be the best she is a character who is just like she just wants to be friends and have a good time and you see it like they there's like these side quests and whatnot where you explore this mansion and then you see this fireworks show or you're on your way to stop the main bad guy from reviving the legendary Pokemon and then you you see her like her determination to try and help you and whatnot and i really like that out of her and i really think she's a really good character and i i kind of wish that uh like because i kind of also saw a similar type of writing with that with lily from sun and moon i kind of wish there was more writing with that towards with hop in a sense towards like from going to the chanting to be i want to be a pokemon professor at the very least, uh, the one thing that at least they kept hop is the fact that he didn't deter from his goals because at the end of the day he wants to be the next kahuna after his grandfather so yeah. he already has his goal versus lily who's still unsure of herself due to the things that had happened to her in the events of sun and moon to wanting to actually be strong like you and ha i mean how now i'm gonna go to the Kalos rivals for a second because like yeah they're they're a little bit one-dimensional in the sense that you know they have their own thing and that's it but you don't actually see that much characterization and I say that particularly to the opposite sex rivals specifically, because like, okay, they have this like, they kind of like are based on Sharon from Black and White, where they want to be stronger than you and they have a little bit more experience than you. But like over time, they become frustrated with why can't I win? Uh, I want to do this, that, but I can't seem to beat you. And then eventually we learn that they become an America Evolution successor alongside Karina, so they learn Mega Evolution. With Shauna, as much as I adore her, honestly, I feel like they, I know that she's just there to kind of like, the journey is the destination and just have a good time. But like, there's not much aside from that. We know that Trevor wants to complete the decks. And then we know that Tierno wants to comprise a team of Pokemon that can dance. And it actually reflects onto his team where almost all of his Pokemon actually have some level of a dancing move, which is neat. I like that kind of storytelling. But Shauna doesn't really have that. And then she only has like three Pokemon by the time you beat her for the last time, actually. I think it's like, what? The starter that's weak against yours, uh, Delcaddy, and then a Gudra. That's it. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess I make sense in the sense that, okay, this is the starter. Um, you know, the starters are cute. And then you have two Pokemon that are also very cute. Which, I guess it makes sense, honestly. I guess it would be more like... Like, I, I guess I wouldn't necessarily like her character more if, like, that wasn't a part of her character, where it's, like, if she was talking about, if she was more kind of along the lines of Hop, where it's, like, I'm going to be the very best, and I'm going to, I'm going to become the champion and everything, and then you, but you don't change anything with how they write her, I feel like I would definitely be more pissed, because, like, you want to be the best, but you're not really trying, but. Exactly. Which is why kind of like, I'm, I guess I'm kind of plugging this in even though I haven't even finished writing the script yet. Um, so I was actually kind of talking with um, my boyfriend and another one of my friends kind of on a separate on a separate note. I'm writing this like sort of like Pokemon Journeys style comic called Acacia. I named it after the Bump of Chicken song that they used for the special music video because mm. if you watch that special music video and you're a Pokemon fan, it just hits different. 
it's yeah. so good it's a love letter to pokemon telling you like hey listen this is how far you've gotten and this is all the things that you've done along the way and here's a special music video to kind of show that and it shows all your favorite characters rivals champions legendary pokemon everybody is here pokemon edition yeah and it's like i i kind of named it after that because like this comic is like exactly what it is a love letter to pokemon so like um, I basically kind of replaced most of the major characters since at least Sun and Moon gave, well, I think it was as early as Oraz, gave us the notion that, yes, alternate universes do exist in Pokemon. And, like, I love the fact that the anime most recently, this is, like, a little bit of a spoiler for Journeys, they actually do explore that idea of alternate universes. I think they've explored that since Sun and Moon, actually. Um, there was that one episode when Ash and Pikachu got sucked into an ultra wormhole by Shiny Tapakoko, and they see this, like, version of Alola that got destroyed by a Guzzlord, and they help fight it back. So, yeah, like, I replaced most of the major characters, but the one thing that I did was actually, like, make five brand new OCs. Well, actually, more like... I have one of my old OCs, and then I made four new ones with um, my uh, friend. And uh, we basically are doing the story of X and Y, but with them. So, like, you have, I call them the Kalos Quintet, because that's what they are. It's a group of five. So, you have that, pers- that fr- um, first friend, his main OC, as, like, the protagonist. He is basically the Kalum, if you choose Kalum in X and Y. And then I gender bent another friend's character to serve as the Serena, who is the rival. Because it actually kind of fits thematically because, like, the first friend, his character's um, main Pokemon is Battle Brawn Greninja. So it makes sense. And then the uh, second character, instead of a Mega Absol that the rival gets at the end of the game, um, she uses Mega Lucario. Which would also be a little bit more thematic considering the fact that, you know, the first Pokemon we see Mega evolve, aside from Mewtwo, was um, Lucario. Yeah. In games, that is, because it's really different. You have Mewtwo, who was like the first promotion for Megas. Then the first episode of the Kalos anime, you have Mega Blaziken. And then Mega Lucario is the first one that we see in the games. So, like, there's that. And then there's my character, who f- serves as the Shauna, basically this cute peppy girl that chooses the starter that's weak against the um, the main character, the first character's uh, starter. And like, I gave her a dream similar to Serena from the anime, where she wants to be a performer. And she likes fairy types because she was raised in Lovera City, which is where the fairy gym is. So I give her like a whole team of like really cute Pokemon that you're just like, okay, these are cute Pokemon. She's a performer. Obviously cute things and performing go hand in hand. So that's her whole like dream. For someone who is the Trevor, there's another character that I had made. Um, he has fossil Pokemon, which makes sense thematically because we had two new fossils in that game and you can find fossil Pokemon. And there's a fossil Pokemon that can Mega Evolve. So it fits. So he has his Mega as well. And he just basically wants to be a world famous Pokemon paleontologist. And then the last character I made in this continuity his dad is actually Seabold of the Elite Four, the water type user who's also a chef. Mm-hmm. And he wants to be like his dad, be a great chef, and he uses water types. I also gave him a fear of electric type Pokemon because he's actually been shocked one too many times by them, so he does not like electric type like at all. Mm-hmm. Now it was really difficult for me to find like a Pokemon that would fit him, to be honest. So um I made it like so that all of the Kalos Quintet had like a Pokemon that could Mega Evolve or change form. So Mm -hmm. you have Battle Bond Greninja, you have Mega Lucario, the Fairy Girl uses Mega Mawile, the Paleontologist uses Mega Aerodactyl. Um, I kind of wasn't thinking about it back then because I had already given another character Mega Blastoise. So I gave him a Mega Slowbro instead, saying that he had went to um, uh, Hoenn. And then he caught a Slowpoke there and he learned about Mega Slow, uh, Slowbro, so he uses that one in his team. Interesting. Yeah, it's still in the works right now, but I basically kind of like um, expanded on what X and Y gave us with the quintet, but I kind of like changed it up a little bit, giving them their own ideals and goals and, you know, personality traits that the games didn't really kind of give us for that time. Uh-huh. We're having fun like writing the characters too, so I can't yeah. wait to release it when I can. It sounds like you're having a lot of fun. So, as much as we love to continue talking, like gushing about like all the other Pokemon games, 
let's get to the topic <laughs> of the video uh brilliant diamond and shining pearl so first things first before we get like really into the game and whatnot like like let's talk about like thoughts about brilliant diamond shining and pearl at first like when we first saw like the the trailer for the game and whatnot and everything like what did you think about it I'm like, oh shit, we have Sido remakes? Finally, I can stop, finally stop playing the Platinum copy over and over and over <laughs> again because I want my Sido fix. But like, I was like, okay, okay, we're getting Sido remakes, finally. I was thinking that this was just going to be a dream that would never happen. But I was very excited when we got Sido remakes, honestly, like... I, I love Sinnoh to death. Like I said, it's in one of my, my top favorite regions. Like, I think my top favorites are um, Sinnoh, uh, Unova, and um, it's kind of a toss-up between Hoenn and um, uh, Alola, to be honest. Hmm. Yeah. But I love, I love Sinnoh to death, so I was like, oh yeah, we're getting Sinnoh remake. Let's go. Yeah. When it came to, um, when I first saw, like, the trailer, like, um... Honestly, I was actually so a, a lot of a lot of people on the internet love to complain about this about the new games and whatnot. Personally, like when I compare like Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl to say go some time back, when I compare it to games like X and Y and Sun and Moon, which were the 3DS, this game is like much more cleaner. Like. It may not look like it to some people, but definitely the look and the, the, the very look of the graphics and whatnot and everything are definitely improving as time goes on with Game Freak sequels and remakes and remasters. And I, I really I really dug on that and like personally like I I am I love the the chibi models that the game loves to implement. Like they kind of uh, strayed away oh. from it with uh they, they kind of strayed away from it when they came to the 3ds because x and y to sword and shield had more of a kind of a top-down realistic life model with each of the characters and uh with f and uh with uh brilliant diamond shining pearl like i i definitely feel uh more of a return to form but more than that it definitely felt more like I don't know, it, it felt more nostalgic. Like, I may not have beaten Diamond and Pearl from back then, but I definitely, like, for the time that I did play Diamond and Pearl, it felt very nostalgic. It felt very, like, a return to form, and I really, like, I, I enjoyed, uh, I, I, mean, I enjoyed, like, what I saw, uh, when I first, uh, when I first saw the trailer and whatnot. And, you know, I was like... I, I was really, uh, I, honestly, I was really dead set on giving them, and I, I'm really glad that I did. And same here, honestly. Like, I saw them for the first time, I'm like, oh, this is actually really cute. Everyone's like, oh, I hate the chibis. I'm like, why? They're cute. Because, like, okay, X and Y had a half chibi sort of ordeal. Like, the Gen 6 games in general, they're, like, half chibi because they still had the huge heads and stuff. Yeah. Then we go on to Sun and Moon, now they're actually properly proportioned, and... Yeah, you think this is the norm for Pokemon. But then you gotta remember that um, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl weren't made by Game Freak. They were made by Illica. So they were probably just given a copy of Diamond and Pearl and basically were told, basically, turn this into 3D. And they kind of took that in a literal sense where like, okay, so they turned it into 3D to the point where now we have a chibi models and everything, which, you know, fits thematically and then people were like yeah. yo we want the diamond and pearl uh, remakes to have actual like full bodies and stuff and i'm like why though this is this is cute like yeah. enjoy the artistic change of pace yeah. now in terms of the games themselves honestly it is exactly what you've been like um given it's it's just diamond and pearl but in a modern standpoint you have better quality of life like the exp all which i'm going to be honest uh, uh the exp all is actually really good I like the EXP all. It, it saves time yeah. from grinding. Because when I go back to play the older games and then you have to like slap an EXP share on one Pokemon and then grind another one, that's tiring. But yeah. everyone gets EXP together? Yeah, that's fun. Like, I understand if you're just like, oh, what if they gave us the ability to turn off the EXP share like they did with Gen 6 and 7? I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But I like the EXP all, regardless. 
Yeah, honestly, I have to agree. Like, um, the a lot of people, and this wraps around to what you were talking about with like uh, the Johto criticisms. With a lot of people talk about how, oh, like the G Gen One and Gen Two, like those games, they used to be difficult as hell. Like, they weren't. They were just more time consuming because they had this the exactly. l bigger level requirement. Like every trainer in red and blue i remember was like every 10 levels so brock was level 10 misty was level 20 and just you had to keep leveling up and grinding and like it, and it was like okay so for a kid like me who had absolutely nothing better to do yeah okay like spending all that time getting all of my pokemon one on one or or like two with every match like up to level 100 and whatnot sure i have the time for that but as an adult, like, with Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl just kind of making mandatory EXP share, that saves me a hell of a lot more time, and I, I have a lot more time in the day to do stuff that I want, while also beating the game and everything. So I definitely say, like, more as an adult, I think Br I think Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl definitely, like, that. I do like it for that. I do, what I also do like is the fact that, okay, yes, this is Diamond and Pearl remastered, so everyone's anticipating, okay, so basically, this is just Diamond and Pearl slapped on 3D, so, and with an EXP all, this is gonna be very easy. No, you're gonna actually see some changes with it, like, okay, yeah, Rourke, like, you go through each of the gym leaders. Rourke was easy, as always, honestly, nothing really changed. Then you move on to Gardenia, and, like, Gardenia actually starts using, like, pretty decent strategies and then you move on to Mei Lin, who actually gave me a bit of a hard time her lucario is not holding the usual berry that you would normally see with the gym leader's ace pokemon no it's holding a big root which boosts the power and healing ability of hp stealing moves like leech life for giga drain and it has drain punch so that thing was killing everybody yeah. Then you had Crusher Wake, who has ice type moves on his water type. So if you think you and your boy Totero are gonna pull up, nah, he's gonna say, nah, nah, nah. I'm gonna end it right there, Chief. And just ice beam or ice fang, ice everything, ice is everywhere, die. <laughs> then you move on to Fantina, who was always hard in Diamond and Pearl and was even harder in Platinum, considering she was the third gym leader that you had to fight. Now, her Miss Magius is holding an expert belt to, like, deal with everybody. You got ghost types, shadow ball. You got dark types, I got dazzling gleam. Y you cannot win against that thing. Yeah. And uh, this also leads into the other question I was talking about. Like, what are your, what is your favorite starter and what are your favorite Pokemons in Gen 4? Okay, so honestly, my favorite starters, I don't have actually a personal favorite with three starters. When I was younger, my uncle was like, okay, the fire types are the best, and I kind of believed him on that one. I chose the fire type literally almost every time. <laughs> Johto had Cyndaquil, Hoenn, I had Torchic. I'll still use Torchic to this day, I love Torchic. Sinnoh, I had Chimchar, and then I stopped when I saw Gen 5. I did not like Tepig at all, but I loved Oshawa, so that was the first time I deviated from the fire starters. Then I went back with Fennec in, in Gen 6. Gen 7, I went with Rowlet the first time, but then I chose Poplio in all my other runs because I loved Poplio to death. Then I went back to fire types again in Gen 8 with Score Bunny because I thought it was the cutest out of the three of them. It's a little yeah. fire bunny. I don't... I don't have a personal favorite with the starters, honestly. Like, looking back at it now, because, like, yeah, I would used to use Chimchar a lot, honestly. Chimchar was pretty goaded, and, you know, the whole joke with Devon and Pearl only having, like, two fire types in the entire game. Yeah. But, like, I still liked... I, I, I still I was okay with Chimchar, and then I used Turtwig instead for my rerun with Shining Pearl, honestly, and I really liked Torterra, so... And I never really used Piplup, despite, like, I thinking Pi uh, Piplup was the cutest of the three of them. But, like, I guess, honestly, the oversaturation with Piplup was, like, okay, like, literally everybody and their mom in the anime had Piplup. Yeah, Piplup I get apparently that. was used by the most characters. It was, like, five people total with Piplup. Like, damn, Piplup is that popular? Which made sense because in Japan they really love penguins, so Piplup is a very, very popular pick for them. So I could understand the appeal, but at the same time, it just made the choice, like, a little more, like, I guess you could say boring? Yeah, I get that. Personally, for me, like, like so. yeah. Personally, for me, it's like because you were talking about how, like, uh, in how your uncle said, like, oh, fire starters are the best. Um, personally, for me, that wraps around back to my days playing red and blue, and like, the I I would heavily disagree back even back then 
because after getting my ass kicked several different times, um, my like my favorite starters throughout every iteration of Pokemon have either been the water type or the grass type, because which I respect. Yeah, because the fire type, like if okay, so it's it's a pretty common thing for a lot of veteran uh, Pokemon fan Pokemon players, but in Viridian Forest, there is a rare chance that you can actually come across a Pikachu, and right. I I like that because like um. I, I would constantly search for like a Pikachu and try to capture it because I knew the second gym trainer. So like when I got through, uh, when I got through Brock, um, I dealt with, I had to deal with Misty. And if I had Charmander on my team, um, pretty much I was getting my, I was getting my chase clapped constantly unless I yeah, had like... I love I love that mentality that we all had as kids playing, like, okay, I haven't played Red and Blue in so much recently, to be fair, like, mm -hmm. I'm doing a random type challenge where I play all the Pokemon games that I have with random types, and the types that I used for Red were Grass types, which I'm gonna just be honest with you, it's hard, it's very hard, Grass types back then did not have any, like, what's the word i guess you could say variety in their moves so like while well, brock and misty and lieutenant surge and even erica to some degree because of how janky gen one was were easy then you have to move all the way to like blaine honestly i was only lucky through the grace of god that blaine didn't really wipe the floor with me and remember i'm using grass types and my starter is bulbasaur so of course your rival has charmander so you have to deal with charizard and then he also has a pidgeot and i'm just like oh yeah. this is horrible yeah. And but like, I love that mentality we all have. Like, okay, the second gym leader is a water type trainer because, like, it's either through general knowledge, maybe you had the guidebook, or hell, you watch the anime. Mm -hmm. And you know that the second trainer, Misty, is a water user. So we're just like, okay, we can catch a Pikachu very early. It's going to take some time, but hey, we're going to use Pikachu against Misty. I love that uh, mentality we all had. Yeah. And I love the fact that they actually admitted that they made Pikachu rare because, like, it actually added to the specialness of it, which made sense, honestly. Nowadays, I'm kind of tired of, like, Pikachu, and I use a lot of, bunch of other electric types. Like, I love yeah. Raichu to death, don't get me wrong. But, like, when you have the present of, like, other electric types in other games, like, um, like, Hoenn had, like, Plusle and Minum, and of course they're weaker than Raichu, but, like, I just like them because they're cute. Or Magnetric, then, like, yeah, you'd want to use those, honestly, because they're at least a lot earlier than a Pikachu. Yeah. Which, move on to the next question you asked me about my favorite Gen 4 Pokemon, like... I really love Pachirisu a lot. Like, uh, it wasn't even because of the World Series, of the VGC Championships. Like, I, the World Championships. Like, I didn't actually care about that until I learned about it much later in life with my internet literacy. That uh, Pachirisu literally helped carry a guy to victory, and now it's like the mascot of the World Championships. And the fact that this same guy actually sweeps Cynthia's team with a team of only Pachirisu. Yeah. So, um,. Yeah, honestly, like, I do have to say, Pachirisu is really good. I did have a moment that made me realize, oh shit, the anime is portraying the game. Because when I was playing Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, I came across Pachirisu. And I was like, oh, cool, I'm gonna catch it. Every single time I tried to, it escaped the ball. And then I recalled to the anime when Dawn was trying to, uh, like, she caught a Pachirisu. She was trying to learn how it worked. And then she was trying to return to the ball. And Pachirisu kept dodging the Pokeball beam. <laughs> yeah, Pachirisu was a brat baby back when it debuted. But then, like, you know, she released it. And she realized she shouldn't give up so easily. And then recaught it and actually learned how to manage it. Which was okay, and it made sense, honestly, like, because all of her Pokemon were, like, cute to some degree, like, you know, Piplup, Paniri, Pachirisu, yeah. Apom, they're all cute. And then, like, we have the Outlier and Mamoswine, but it started out as a cute little swine up. Yeah. Then she had uh, Cyndaquil, uh, that's cute, and also tied into Heart Gold and Soul Silver, which was nice. And then we had uh, Togekiss. She didn't have it as a Togepi, but Togekiss is cute, and I love Togekiss to death. Like, Togepi was actually one of my first favorite Pokemon of all time because like I really loved its sound in the anime the cute little chirping sounds honestly and I always wanted a Togepi for myself so badly I just wanted to hold a Togepi in my arms too just like Misty uh, like Misty and I was really pissed when she released it but it made sense I was still upset because I wanted her to keep the Togepik and then like Togekiss was introduced and I'm like are you gonna get Togekiss gone here you can have my Togekiss yes 
<laughs> I love Togekiss. It was, it's one uh, of my. It's still one of my favorites to this day as well. That's another of my favorites. I love Togekiss to death, honestly. Yeah. Uh, let me see what other favorite Pokemon. Cause like, it was really hard because like Gen Four, like the Pokemon were either a hit or a miss for me. Like some of the early Dex Mons, like um, like uh, the starters and stuff, Star uh, Star I wasn't like it was eh for me. But then you move on to like the Pokemon that were introduced in Platinum that actually got their evolutions. You got two new evolutions. I love them to death. Actually, let me take that back. I like Leafeon, I hate Glaceon. I don't hate Glaceon for its typing or anything of like that. I think Glaceon's really cool. It's just on the bottom of my list when it came to evolutions because I didn't really use the Glaceon as often because yeah. of how late you have to get it. Like, you can't get it until like the seventh gym, and then there's like other ice types. They give you Weavile, they give you Snow Run, Swinub, they give you these cooler ice types, and then you're stuck with the Eevee that you got from BB from like the third gym. And you have to wait until you climb all the way up and like your Eevee's already lagging behind, which was very lame for me. So yeah. I was okay with Sword and Shield fixing that and I was able to use Glaceon at one point, but it was a Pokemon that I would prefer other ice types over. Leafeon, on the other hand, was easier to get because Eterna Forest was right there, so you could just bike back to Eterna, level up once, boom, you get a Leafeon. So I actually used it as my grass type go to. Yeah. Okay. Although, it was funny because um, I did replay Platinum a while back, long before like the announcement of Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Mm -hmm. and I got the Eevee, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go get um, a Leafeon. And then I went into the grass, I found a Shiny Badoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that Eevee became a Vaporeon because I knew I needed a water type. <laughs> <laughs> It's shiny, I mean, hey, listen, and actually, that shiny Roserade was one of the reasons why I like Roserade now, because, like, hey, you playing Platinum again? Hey, you want this pretty, you want this little Badoo with a purple bib? Fuck yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, and personally, I'm on my side, like, yeah, I, lo I really, I, I'm kind of with you, honestly. Like, a lot of the Pokemon in Gen 4 have kind of been hit or miss. Like, I know a lot of people are like, oh, you need Shinx and Star and Star Raptor and whatnot. And, like, like Everyone okay. <laughs> yeah. And, I like, oh. The meme, it's the meme with, like, oh, yeah, Devin and Pearl remakes, time to try out a new team. Then you get Infernus, Star Raptor, <laughs> yeah. Floatzel, Lucario, um, Luxray, and Garchomp. Yep. Not you. The team setup is not bad. You have a fire type. You have two fighting types. Your Staraptor is one of the best early game birds we've been given so yeah. far. Garchomp is a beast. Like the teams are not bad. I think the only one who's bad is Luxray because it has such a good attack stat, but oh, so few electric moves that proc with that attack stat. That's the only problem I have with it. Because like it, it just seems to fall behind. But everything else is actually really good. Yeah, that's, that's what I was about to say. It's like, like in terms of like the t team and what you need in terms of like battle and whatnot. Yeah, I do agree. It, it is very they're very useful. Like, but in terms of like, it, of terms of like my favorite, mm -hmm. honestly, Pokemon out of Gen Four. I'm like, it's is it's hit or miss, honestly. And I would have to agree. Like, definitely, I, I definitely would think that uh, Leafeon. It, personally for me i i do like leafeon just be like and on top of that like leafeon is in terms of like if i if you were to ask me like what would be the pokemon i would ideally take in real life i would have to say leafeon because leafeon is just a walking talking lovable air purifier <laughs> oh man this is why we love pokemon we have living air purifiers that, that is li that is literally in his decks i that looked it up dogs. I, I looked it up and apparently that um what 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 uh Leafeon does is that it takes like the air that everyone breathes and whatnot and then it renews it it purifies it like a tree and then it makes it fresh air for you to use so when it like you know when the apocalypse happens like Leafeon is the Leon is the go-to choice. I mean, I would say Shaman would be a better choice because it actually has the ability to purify air on a larger scale than Leafeon. But then that's also the nature of grass-type Pokemon in general. They're basically plant animals and they just, yeah. they have natural abilities of photosynthesis, just like real plants. Yeah, they eat and stuff, but they can also feed themselves by photosynthesizing, which is pretty useful. You yeah. already know that if I had a if I had a choice of taking a Pokemon in real life, I would take a Sylveon because that thing is an emotional support dog and I need one of those. <laughs> 
let's see what other gen 4 pokemon i like i already said that i really love togekiss it's like it's it's togepi but now it can fly and stuff i, I love it to death i kind of wish that i used it for my um demon pearl uh, um run but uh i did catch a togepi it took way too long to even try to evolve so i was like okay goodbye uh more recently i do have other um gen 4 pokemon like dusknor was one of my first favorites in gen 4 and it was mostly because of mystery dungeons like, I like the idea that, okay, this is Dustnor, he's like a world-famous explorer and stuff, and like, it turns out he was actually an antagonist, and he's a bad guy, I'm like, oh, that's Shaq actually fucking clean, like, okay, I really love Dustnor a lot. Hmm. Like, to this day, I still love Dustnor, honestly. I like, I even have a character who uses a Dustnor as his name, per uh, Pokemon, it's great. Um... I love Frostlass as well. I've recently been using Frostlass too. Like, like I guess, like, I really like the idea of like, hey, this is a Yuki Ona, the Pokemon, and it's actually kind of cool looking. So yeah, Frostlass and Gallade. I've already mentioned I really like Gallade mm -hmm. for the obvious reasons. I personally prefer it over Guard of War now. Yeah, most recently, that. I've been using some unconventional Pokemon. Like, most recently, I showed it off to you, but um, I have a shiny Drapion, actually. I caught it as a Scorope because I was like, okay, I don't know what to fill the last part of my team with. Like, I don't know, honestly. I could use the Licky Licky because Licky Licky was actually pretty freaking goaded. But I was like, nah, I'm kind of bored of, like, normal types. So I'm going to use a type that only has, like, one weakness. And I'm like, okay, Drapion it is. So... I actually was like, I had a better idea. I'm gonna shiny hunt it. So it took me like a few hours to find a shiny Scalopi and I caught it immediately and I used Drapion. And now Drapion is one of my favorites now. Uh, I guess um, personally, like I know it was, uh, personally I would definitely have to say like, well, I'm not too sure about like Gardevoir. I do like Gallade. But personally, I am more like, cause I like kind of more the cuter Pokemon and stars and whatnot. And um, Same. I I would definitely not necessarily Garvor, but I would definitely have to say Ralts, just because Ralts is just adorable. Oh yes, we love the child with the bowl haircut. <laughs> yeah, like I, I I showed you, I think I showed you this. It's like I I asked you like uh, you know what are the chances of getting like Ralts in Dazzling Cave, and you said there's like a a five percent five percent chance as soon as you said that and i started playing the game i was like okay i'm gonna spend hours trying to catch ralt L literally the next time i get into dazzling cave which was five minutes later there's a ralt right there and it's got like life do it's got allies which has got all these unique moves and whatnot i'm like yeah i'm capturing this one yeah because like i learned that the pokemon found in the grand underground actually have egg moves which is actually pretty freaking good so I did catch myself a Ralts there, and I evolved it into a Gallade, and I had a very funny story involving evolving it to a Gallade, because I actually was like, okay, I want to use Gallade and Frostlass this time around, because I never get to use those Pokemon. Right. So um, I was wondering why the Dawnstone that I had actually gotten from my Pachirisu, who used Pickup, uh, wasn't working. And then they were like, okay, you need to give it the Dawnstone, though. And I was like, okay, give it to Hold. So I actually swapped out the Everstone that it was holding with the Dawnstone and leveled up, and it became a Gardevoir, and I'm like, oh, shit. So I, I realized the only way I could reset my game was before I had the Dawnstone, so it would be another random chance of finding it, and it was like a 4% chance. <sighs> the, I realized the reason why was because it was still holding the Everstone. <laughs> You see, I had some pretty big brain moments. Very not, big brain is actually a overstatement. I had a pea brain moment right there, <laughs> and um, I suffered for it. So I had to wait until I had surf because it turns out you could find one in Mount Coronet very easily. And then I was able to find another one when I reached snow points. So I was able to get a frost last, but like <sighs> thinking about that made me hurt because I could have just had a frost last by now as well. But yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Love my pea brain moments. But yeah, Gen 4 has a lot of good, good Pokemon that I really love. Like, aside from those regular Pokemon I said, I love I love Manaphy, I love Shaman, mm -hmm. I love Cresselia, and I really, really love Garatina. Yeah. Like I think I think the scene that when in Pokemon Platinum when Garatina shows up from the dark portal and just snatches Cyrus and takes him away, everyone would have been scared shitless. I was like, oh my god, that's awesome. And it, we, it's basically the Pokemon version of Satan. And I'm like, oh that's awesome. He's so cool looking. And now we feed it cupcakes. <laughs> I there's a there's there was an image I I've I've shared this around multiple times and I have this video on my, on my second channel. But there is an image of uh, just uh, just uh, a Giratina just popping out of the dark portal, and it's like it's in the edge of its wings, like shaped perfectly, 
and then there's a second there's a second image edited with just a W, a red W, and all of a sudden it just looks like uh it, it just looks like two eyes, a cat mouth, and just it's it's small hands. <laughs> Oh yes, the Ooh Garatina. I think Dorkly actually did one where they had like, what if um, Pokemon met their shiny counterparts? And like, there was the two Garatina talking and stuff, and they're like, oh uh, yeah, you know, um, the regular Garantina was like, uh, yeah, I actually have a trainer right now, so I can't really take over the world and rule hell. And it's like, what, you bow down to mere mortals? And then the portal opened, and you hear this little boy coming like, come on Aquafina, it's time to go to the beauty pageant, or <laughs> I think it was something along the lines, like he, I convinced them that you're just a dog, and then the shiny Garantina is walking through the portal, like, coming to me. <laughs> they named him Aquafina. Now I kind of regret like not actually going along with um, resetting for a shiny Garatina because now I want to name one Aquafina, and I might as well just do that. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so, in terms of like the the brilliant diamond and shining pearl, like, what are your thoughts on the changes and or differences that it did? Like I said, I really love the quality of life updates. I do love the EXP all. I love the fact that they actually give us Pokemon that were introduced in Pat uh, Platinum in the Grand Underground, even though they aren't in the Pokedex officially. And um, I do love, I, I actually, like, people are like, oh, Brilliant Diamond was easy. Like, people actually did probably have, like, an easier time going through all the gyms and stuff because they used the Diamond and Pearl teams as opposed to the Platinum teams, which are more thematically correct. Mm -hmm. And then you pull up to the Elite Four, and then, like, every member of the Elite Four got, like, some kind of strat going on with all their Pokemon. They're just like, what the fuck? What is this? Like, you have a Dust Tox that can uh, stall and use Moonlight with Aaron. You got Bertha holding, giving her um, Wish Cash, a Rindo Berry, so it, wait, yeah, a, um, a Rindo Berry, so it doesn't, like, get one shot by a grass move. You got Flint with his unburdened baton pass, uh, minimize Drift Blim and the untouchable Infernape. You got Lucian, which was actually difficult to figure out, and then I realized he's running a Trick Room team. Hmm. And then Cynthia pulling up like the boss bitch that she always is. All her Pokemon have 31 IVs, fully EV trained. Then you pull up with the Garchomp and you're like, I right, Garchomp, time to Ice Beam this motherfucker. Ice Beam, it got a Yache Berry holding so it reduces the effects of the ice moves. It has a speed modifying nature and Swords Dance. And you think you could pull up with a Fairy type? Nah, it's gonna poison jab it harder than Kakashi using the 1000 years of death on Naruto. <laughs> That shit will fuck you up. I'm like, holy shit, Cynthia is actually cooking the fucking scary. How the hell am I gonna beat her? Like, she actually made me need to use big brain energy. Like, you you always thought Cynthia was hard when you were a kid because, oh, she has all these goaded Pokemon. No, it just couldn't read. Now we can read and we're like, all right, Cynthia, this is gonna be easy. All right, Garchomp, get sturdy with Swords Dance. <laughs> Hit him with an earthquake. I'm like, what? What? Why is she moving faster than me? What the fuck is this? <laughs> I think I sent you the video that I, sh I I need to actually send you that video where this guy was like, all right, it's over, Cynthia. I got five Pokemon left and you only got one. And then Gar <laughs> and she's like, all right, Garchomp, put him on a t-shirt. And then she just spammed Earthquake on the Dialga. And then like, all right, all right, I, I'm all right. It's a crit. It's okay. All right, Inferno, burn him. All right, use Dragon Claw, bitch. <laughs> and, then, and then the guy sends out his Staraptor is like, I hope she don't kill my bird. Garchomp smack the shit out that bird. I'm about to smack the shit out that bird. And then she just one shots the Staraptor is like, oh Lord Jesus, have mercy on my bird. Uh, what do I do? Nothing. In fact, Garchomp use uh, Dragon Claw on him too. Ayo, hey, chill. <laughs> Gar like the Garchomp became even more of a menace. Like Cynthia actually has a bigger brain than we do. How does that? How does that work? Like. Actually, all of her team is like stacked. You got, um, you got a uh, Spiritomb. I actually kind of don't know what Spiritomb does, but Spiritomb's always been a tanky Pokemon. Mm. So I would like to assume that it probably has Infiltrator. So if you try to set up screens, it would actually go through anyway. Uh, she has a special attacking Lucario rather than the physical attacking one. Mm -hmm. And it's also a speedy. She has a Roserade. I think it has like, um, it has a myriad of moves to actually counter like any of its weaknesses. Like you blow up Psychic or Ghost type. Uh, it has Shadow Ball, apparently. <clears throat> Gastrodon is holding the leftovers, and it's tanky. My Lodic is using what I like to call the Stall Lodic Strat, which you give it a Flame Orb, and it procs with its Marvel Scale ability, and it even has like moves like Recover to keep itself alive. And you think you could try to Thunder Punch it? Nah, it has Scald, so it can burn you. You want to try using Torterra? It has Ice Beam or Blizzard, apparently. 
Yeah, Cynthia is not playing these games anymore, honestly. And it's even scarier when she actually has a rematch team and all of her team is stacked again and she actually just replaced one of her Pokemon with a Porygon Z. Oh. Yeah, um... The, the, the remakes are... There's remakes thinking, making you think it's easy until you reach the Elite Four and you're just like, what the fuck do I do now? <laughs> Grinding is not gonna help because, like, they know how to, like, counter almost every trick in the book, so you actually have to be big brain and give your Pokemon, like, actually useful items. Like, I gave my Manaphy an Icy Rock and gave it Hail so that it can actually proc with Frostlass's um, Snow Cloak and basically give it a sure hit Blizzard. And that was really how I won against Cynthia for the third time I fought her. Because it was already hard enough to get back to her by the Elite Four. Then Cynthia pulls up and she's like, alright, I'm about to end your fucking career. She oh, Horribly hard, but that's actually the beauty in it. Because like people are always complaining, oh, the Pokemon games are too easy. Yeah, and then um, BDSP shows up and then you have the Elite Four with like a stacked team. And then what's even better is that now you can actually rematch the gym leaders now in this game. And not only do they give them teams that are accurate to their types, but now they're also stratted up too. Like, I remember seeing a clip where the Gardenia sends out a jump pluff and the jump pluff outspeeds and uses sleep powder and leech seed. These these players are these players are are fucked up if they don't realize that the game actually is harder. You just need to think more. Yeah. Uh, so with all that said, um, pretty much this can be this can be minor or this can, even or major, whichever. Uh, do you, are there any like real uh criticisms or nitpicks you have with Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl? I really wish they gave us a platinum. They gave us the platinum Pokedex. I understand that they wanted to stay faithful to Diamond and Pearl, but I really wish they gave us a platinum Dex, honestly, instead of a Diamond and Pearl Dex. It would have just worked so much better. Because I remember the trailer when it first showed and it panned onto um, Floraroma Town. You see that one NPC in Platinum who gives you the Grace of if you have the Event Shaman. Mm -hmm. I really wish they gave us the platinum Dex instead. I thought it would fit a whole lot better. Yeah, maybe you can keep the teams the same, I guess, but they actually made the teams work, but I really wish the Platinum Dex was there yeah. because, like, you know, we would love to use our favorite Pokemon from Platinum, like, actually normally. Like, we want to use Pokemon like Leafeon and Glaceon or Glade or Probopass or Gliscor. Yeah. Another um, thing that I really didn't like was the fact that um, they made um, Gligar, like, a version exclusive. Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> That made zero sense to me. <laughs> well, personally on my side, like, um... I would definitely say it's a, it's a minor nitpick. And it's something that... But it's ultimately something, like, if I... Like, because I, I will play, like, a Pokemon game for a good chunk of time. And then kind of uh, get off of it for a little bit. Because I just need to... Just, you know, I just want to do something else. But then later on down the line, I'll play it again. I'd say my one little nitpick here is with the underground cave, it's not necessarily like with anything continuing, it's more of just like how to enter and exit it. Because like they tell you, like when you get to the second town, they tell you, oh, you can actually travel to the grand underground, here's the equipment and here's how you do it. And they do that once, but they don't really like have any, uh, anything showing up to where it's like oh yeah if you forgot how to do this here's how you do it because it took me a while to realize oh i can actually just i can actually just press this for the underground cave and if i want to get out oh i can just press y yeah i mean i guess they didn't really give you that notion honestly but i played Sinnoh so many times that i knew that the grand underground actually did function similarly to the regular underground so you had to press uh, press like x or y to go back up and stuff so like i was okay i was already used to that kind of notion i'm just glad the fact that with the case of the grand underground it's more or less like the wild area but like at least a little bit more like i guess you can say filling because like the wild area when you go through the wild area for the first time they only have like oh here are a bunch of all these pokemon that you've seen in past games if you want to use them but, like grand underground you have not only old pokemon as well but you can also use like pokemon that were exclusive to platinum like you want a togepi early in the game yeah sure here have a togepi you want to use like a lickitung yeah use lickitung that's fine like i like that ocean i actually really like the quality of life that were given to us through the yeah. grand underground so i think it's like the better rendition of the wild area yeah. some people are like oh this is just the watered down wild area i actually like the grand underground a lot more 
Yeah. And again, that what I was talking about, that's that's just a minor nitpick. Like that again, that's again, I that's like if I really have some questions, that's just something I can just look up on the internet for. It's like it's not really like anything that's it's not anything that really hinders my thoughts on Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl overall. It's just something that like ah, uh, you know, you you could have just done this, like maybe make a little sign somewhere like every five like every like five uh like pathways or so just make a sign like by the way you can use y or something but this is a minor nitpick but yeah pretty much that's uh i think that more or less kind of covers brilliant diamond shining pearl but uh that does not cover the whole of gen 4 what we got coming up because we got pokemon arceus next so oh, yeah, um like what are your thoughts on uh, Pokemon Arceus? And this can be, like, in regards to, like, what you've heard on the internet and what you've... And, like, just kind of, like, what are your thoughts overall on it? Like, I'm just gonna... I'm gonna discount the rumors so far, because, like, I really like the, like, uh, um, what we've been given so far. So this is basically a combination of, like, Pokemon and Monster Hunter stories and a little bit of Breath of the Wild. Well, actually, it's more like Monster Hunter, to be honest, because there are, it's not open, open world, but you have these vast areas that you're able to explore and do missions with. So it gives you more of a Monster Hunter vibe than a Breath of the Wild vibe. Yeah. I really like the new Pokemon that we've been, like, given so far. Like, I really like the fact that there were actually evolutions to old Pokemon that we've seen. And, like, we have these regional variants as well. I love the fact that we're still keeping regional variants to this day. Like, that it was always such, like, a great addition to Pokemon that we have Pokemon that we know adapt to new different environments, you know? Yeah. And I really like the fact that, you know, they're starting to kind of, like, tease us with these, like, new regional variants through, like, meta, like, um, uh, like, promotions and stuff and, like, different ways of doing it rather than just say, oh, hey, here's a new regional variant. No, there's now new things. There's, like, okay, there was the sprite thing for, um, Surfetch. There was the 24-hour stream that showed Galarian Ponyta. And then now there's like these mini games on the Pokemon website, and then in, we have um, Hisuian Voltorb, which I think is actually one of the cutest new regional variants, honestly. Like, it's just a happy Voltorb. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's always so angry and it's kind of ugly, but now it's happy, <laughs> but it gets too happy and blows up. I'm like, oh. <laughs> They even they even showed a stop motion animation about like how, what happens when a Hisuian Voltorb gets too excited and it accidentally like shocked and electrocuted the berries that all the Pokemon had worked hard to collect and like Pikachu's like why the fuck did you do this and I'm like oh uh, oops. So I really like how they're advertising like the new regional variants and then we're having rumors that the final evolutions are actually going to have regional variants and the reason why we're not shown the um, evolutions of the current regional variants is probably because like oh they're basically gonna they're basically making new Pokemon like in the case of the Sword and Shield where the regional variants are given brand new evolutions altogether. Yeah. Which First... I really like honestly. Yeah alright. Personally um... Pokemon Arceus, I heard a lot of, like, uh, same with you, I heard a lot of people talking about, oh, this is gonna be a brand new open world Pokemon game, and, like, I think, like, more or less, yes, but actually no, because I've noticed a pattern with the, with the previous other games. When they introduce a, when they introduce something new, or when they introduce a mechanic and whatnot, I noticed that it more or less, they kind of test the waters with it at first when it's introduced, kind of play around with it in the next gen and then if they want to keep it or if it's not too much they decide like in the next gen going down they decide do we keep it or do we remove it that's kind of the same thing i saw with like a big example is mega evolution mega evolution came out and like everyone was excited and it was a cool thing then uh they decided to expand a little more on that with uh omega ruby alpha sapphire where you have like dialga or not dialga uh kyogre rudron and rayquaza be able to do these amazing mega evolutions and then with sun and moon while you could still do mega evolution and whatnot that was still possible that got backseated for z moves which are very i i, I feel like that's t that more or less kind of uh is something that feels very like anime centered because it has it, like it if whereas like mega evolutions they have these big power-ups and everything and they have these different changes of forms z moves definitely feel more like this is something that would feel more at home with 
the anime and it's just something that feels more at home. Not to say that it's bad, it's just like this, it's a different like stylistic change. And then with uh, Sword and Shield, um, they did get rid of all of that and then replaced it with Dynamaxing. And I think the major reason I don't think a lot of people necessarily really consider is that a lot of that stuff, Z moves, Mega Evolution, they were done on the 3DS. And the Switch is ultimately a different console altogether. So right. if uh, if a new if, if Game Freak or whatever studio they were collaborating with to do a new game was going to introduce that, they would probably have to go through a bunch of the old data for like X and Y, Omega Ruby, Ash, Sapphire, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and be like, okay, now we have to import all of that and make it perfect for the new consoles and everything. So ultimately, I don't think that might not. Yeah, ultimately, I wasn't really considering like, uh, in term considering like anything major for Pokemon Arceus. And in terms of the open world, again, back to my point about like how they introduce stuff. Like, I'm in agreement where I think this is more kind of like Monster Hunter, or even in my experience with Ragnarok Odyssey, where they have certain areas enclosed and everything with NPCs and whatnot, but they have these giant wild areas where you can like. A actively like go out and like capture and battle and everything and what i think this is moving because i kind of saw this more with uh sword and shield where i think this is moving along the lines of is years down the line uh game freak and pokemon company are going to collaborate maybe with a uh a potential uh a studio and developer and make a full-on pokemon mmo and that's why i think that's not right now, but that's eventually eventually down the line. And I feel like Pokemon Arceus is kind of more of one of those stepping stones towards that potential goal. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, like, I know that, like, alright, I think this was kind of like a thing since, like, the very first game, I want to say, like, okay, so Gen 1, this is the introduction to Pokemon and stuff. Gen 2 introduces genders, breeding, shinies, and the day and night cycle. Gen 3 introduces double battles um, and natures and um, a bunch of other stuff. Gen 4 introduces the physical special split, the split, as well as, like, these, like, other changes, like, all right, from Gen 3, we had contests, now they revamp the contests, and in, Gen, uh, in Heart, Blue, Soul, Silver, we have Walking Pokemon, which was become, like, one of the more, like, wanted, um, traits in every Pokemon game possible, with the, um, Pokeathlon for, like, side stuff, Battle Frontier, uh, EV, IV breeding, and things like that, and also introduces the Masuda method. Gen 5 introduces stuff like triple battles, rotation battles, and um, all those other stuff. Gen 6 introduces Megas Gen, uh, and Pokemon Ami. Gen 7 introduces Z-moves, while well, keeping the Megas from previous games. And then Gen 8 um, introduces like the quality of life changes we know. We have the easier EV and IV training, we have the easier breathing methods, and things like that. So. You know, the thing is about with Megas that you had pointed out that these things were in the 3DS, you have to remember that Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu actually had Megas. Oh, yeah. They were just available post-game like Sun and Moon did. So they they had the chance to bring back Megas, but they didn't want to in, in favor for this new gimmick in the terms of Dynamaxing. <clears throat> Which a, not a lot of people didn't really like, honestly, because they're like, oh, the Pokemon get bigger. And then now, like, in a competitive standpoint, yeah, um, Dynamaxing is kind of annoying, honestly. Yeah. It's like, you're gonna get yourself swept by, like, a freaking Lugia that just Dynamax and spams Max Airstream to boost its speed entirely. Or on the or on the flip side, like, you, you Dynamax as a last resort, and then all of a sudden, like, the enemy Pokemon just takes you down. It was just completely worthless. Yeah, so like they could have brought it back with like um, Gen Four. To be honest, mm -hmm. they had the means and resources to. Yeah, it would take a little bit longer, but they had the resources. Okay, give me a second. All right. So yeah, they have the resources and means to actually implement Megas at the very least. Maybe even into Gen Eight, because like you have all the Pokemon from Gen One through Four, and from what I remember, there was only two Pokemon that were given Megas following those um, regions. And hell, maybe it would have been the perfect chance to introduce Megas that weren't actually available that we were supposed to get. Like, I remember that I still am annoyed about this to this day, where, like, we were supposed to get a Mega Fly gone, but the only reason why we didn't was because Ken Sugimori had Art Block. 
I mean, on one know, hand, as I... you and I have before, and you and I as artists, you know how demoralizing art block can be. Yeah, yeah, that's it's it's a pain. It's a real pain. Yeah. yeah. But um, I know I I I, I tackled on this a little earlier in my talk about Mega Evolutions. Which uh, side note, um, I do have uh, Let's Go EV and Really Dinosaur and Pearl. I still have yet to complete them because I work a full time job, but uh from what you said like um i actually i i, I do kind of want to see that i want to see uh the mega evolutions and let's go so uh may, hopefully in the yeah, future it's a post -game thing, i believe yeah. it's post games so hopefully. don't worry it took me a very long time to beat let's go because like i realized how under leveled i was and yeah let's go grinding is a bit of a pain because you get your exp actually raises better with like the catching mechanics rather than from battling so that was tiring as it is and beating it with like the most jankiest team that you could ever think of. I had the starter Eevee, I had a wig um no not wiggly stuff, I had a Kaflable, I had a Lolan Raichu and a Lolan Ninetales for the trades, and then I had um a Kabutops and a Aerodactyl. That was my final team from Let's Go. But I, I didn't really care, I was kind of just having fun, just vibing, and I thought Let's Go was kind of cute. Mm -hmm. Then like then Sword and Shield was kind of funnier as well because, like, I've already told the story of you, to you multiple times about how literally half of my team at one point playing Sword and Shield were literally fairy types. Because, <laughs> like, I was like, oh, yeah, these, there's these all these Pokemon and literally the ones that I like the most are fairies. Sign me up. I was kind of in the same... And I only... I was kind of in the same boat. And on, the only reason why I got shield was um it was because of Galarian um Ponyta. I'm like, it's a little unicorn. Like if I was eight years old and I saw that when I still was like in my I really love unicorns and stuff. I had a unicorn plushie. I even watched the last unicorn like fifty million times because I really loved it. I would be crying tears of joy. And I kinda did for that reason. And I did use Galarian Rapidash, although I benched it much later on for Hatterene, so I love that the I love that pretty much even without looking a big reason why they make Galarian uh, a unicorn was because that's Scotland's native ant, Scotland's national animal. Man, we respect Scotland for the fact that it was an all national animal, something that doesn't even exist. <laughs> yeah, they're thinking outside the box. I mean, yeah, honestly. So Maybe final team team and like sword and shield was actually kind of like funny and jinx like i started with score bunny so it was a cinderace um i had hatterene and grimmsnarl because i really liked them a lot i did have malcreamy at one point but i bitched that and i had frostmoth i had a mantine and then i had toxtricity that was my final team okay <laughs> i had a mantine because i didn't vibe with any of the water types back then like i didn't like barasquita i thought it was ugly I didn't like Dreadnought. I thought it was ugly. <laughs> I was actually going to use Arctivish until I realized this fucker's head and mouth was on its fucking head. On the top of the head. Like, what the fuck happened to you? Arctivish has to be like the it. most tortured Pokemon in existence. Just the mismatched of fossils. Just like, I had one where it's just like I had a weak dragon body on top and there's this giant ice fish body on the bottom. And it's just like every living moment of this Pokemon's life is agony. Actually, to be fair, I think Dracovish, as much as I hate it, is literally the most tortured one of them all. It literally has gills and legs at the same time. Uh. And it's always like, yo, it needs water to breathe. I'm like, damn, so we're practically letting this thing die slowly. <laughs> at the very least, and then there's like, uh, Arctazolt with like, it's perpetually cold and shivering. I'm like, aw. And then we have Dracozolt, who's literally just dummy thick on one end. Oh, uh, well, at least it's not dying internally. Mm -hmm. I think Arctivish has to be like the least tame of all of them because, like, yeah, its head is upside down, but you could probably just shovel food down there and it'll still live. I'll take that over the freaking walking tail headed abomination. <laughs> Any day of the week. Uh, well, um, as we wrap up here, I might as well end it on, uh, like one last question. So, pretty much. Uh, as we go into the future, because I'm pretty sure Pokemon's not going to stop anytime soon. Um, of course at not. any time, like, do you, are there any hopes for, like, the future games? They can be minor, they can be major, like, do you have any hopes for the future games? I honestly don't know, to be fair, honestly, because I've been so content with, like, what Pokemon has given us so far. So, like, okay, so, um, we have, uh, alright, we still have Megas and stuff. Maybe they should bring Megas back. Maybe they'll have... 
maybe they'll finally listen to the player base for once or something saying that oh we want to have all five regions or something or maybe we can get new regions based on different places because i remembered saying reading the reason why that they made like the newer regions in like other countries or that it's based on like where pokemon is very popular so you have two regions based in america then you have two of them based in like europe and then it made sense honestly it it, it just made sense that they were just thinking about the places where Pokemon is at its peak. Like, yeah, Americans love Pokemon. Like, why do you see all the freaking Pikachu balloons every Macy's Thanksgiving parade? And then, like, the UK really loves Pokemon and stuff, and France, too. Like, like I, I can't wait to see other regions, that other areas that actually are very po uh, popular with Pokemon. Maybe they have, like, maybe we'll have an Australian region someday or something. But I don't want to keep my hopes too up, honestly. I just stick with what I got for now, honestly, and I'm just, I'm just vibing. I'm just chilling. Yeah, I am 100% with you. But I mean, if I had to say like hopes for future games, honestly, I've got like two in particular. The first, uh, bring back Mystery Dungeon. Oh yeah, I remember that they said that Gates Infinity actually did very poorly, so that's what killed the Mystery Dungeon franchise. And it took only a while before Super came back and kind of like revived it in a sense. And then we have Mystery Dungeon um, Rescue Team DX. So I'm like, okay, maybe they'll bring back Mystery Dungeon. They could bring back the Ranger games, but like it might be difficult to implement on the Switch, honestly, unless you want to use the motion control that lets the EV used. Alternatively, I think they should bring back the Ranger games in a mobile game because Pokemon Go's success was the fact that this is a very easy way for people to get into Pokemon. It's a game that you don't really have to spend too much time on. Hey, listen, you walk around, random play uh, Pikachu, you can catch it, whatever. It's nice. So, like, I actually, like, people, I remember back in 2016 when Pokemon Go first dropped and everyone was, like, going fucking crazy over it. <laughs> and doing some dumb shit with it. Now the kind of died down and they still have their events and they even accommodated things because of the pandemic. So like, yeah, they may should do something similar, honestly. Like they did Pokemon Go and then they made Let's Go as like, hey, you like the Pokemon Go games and you actually want to get into Pokemon? Here's a game that actually plays similar to Pokemon Go and it uses the first region to get you kind of like up to speed. So it kind of like, like we can bring back like some other like old games like yeah i know how many people have been begging for like a, re a remake of like con of um no, not conquest well not just conquest but coliseum and xb that would be really cool yeah with the fairy typing the physical special slit people really love the concept and like um coliseum was a really fucking cool game for its time yeah. then maybe like Battle Revolution, honestly, was one of my favorites, even though nobody really liked it that much. Like, I liked the idea of, like, a 3D Coliseum. Like, yeah, Pokemon Stadium and Battle Revolution, yeah, they should bring those games back, too. Like I said, I really want Ranger back. Maybe they can bring it in a mobile game. You could draw the loops with your fingers. It's easy. <laughs> and, like, there was another game, Pokemon Conquest, that kind of played, like, um... It basically played, like, um, Fire Emblem, in a sense, where you have Pokemon as the units that you move around. And it also played, like, Final Fantasy um, Tactics. So I feel like they can bring back these side games as well, you know? Yeah. That's what I personally would want from Pokemon. I want to see more of the side games. I don't want to see like, okay, we're going to get a new region or a new remake every time. Like, yeah, a remake would be great. But like, I want the side games back. I want other Pokemon games to play. So they had the right idea when they were doing Pokemon Snap and Rescue Team DX. So they should do that more, in my opinion. Personally, yeah, I, I do agree. And the second thing I kind of hope is that uh, we get more, like, we, we get a little more attention focused, whether it's uh, other ports or whether it's uh, for future consoles or whether it's a uh, re-collaboration back. Right, right. I would love uh, more Pokemon tournament games. This is on, this is personally on me. Because I, yeah, I, I honestly have played uh, Pokemon Tournament a lot of times. I play them with Dooms, and honestly, it is really, really fun. It's just like, it's just this giant arena fighter that incorporates like the the technical fighting that uh, a lot of our games do, and it's it, it's really it, it's just really fun. Like being able to f being able to take a Pokemon like. Uh, uh blast toys and just have him blast the whole stage with water or blaziken have him do a bunch of fucking fire kicks yeah 
like I honestly I'm not big on fighting games personally I don't really see like like I'm, I don't enjoy fighting games as much honestly like yeah especially being around a lot of people who are like tryhards I, I don't deal with fighting games like that I'm yeah very I get that when it comes to game. but like yeah Pokemon is actually a really cool game we have an actual Pokemon fighting game like that's the kind of thing that they kind of needed to do. Like, I think they were trying to dabble in, like, other types of games as well. Like, yeah, Pokémon was pretty much a success with the fighting game franchise. Not to mention we have a bunch of other big-name Pokémon in Smash Bros. So mm -hmm. that's also another thing. Then we had, like, a Pokémon racing game for the DS, like, when the DS first came out. So, like, I, I like the idea of them, like, reaching out to other different, like, genres of games and implementing Pokémon onto it in some unique way. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, that's uh. I think... Like I said, my my dream is just the side games. That's it. I want more Mystery Dungeon. Hell, please remake Explorers of Sky. That'd be great. <laughs> I love Explorers of Sky. It's the best. Uh, but yeah, uh, pretty much. I think that's gonna be doing it. Thank you so much for joining me for this. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And uh, do you want to tell, since this is going to be up on YouTube, you want to tell uh, the people like where they can find you and whatnot? Follow me, the Dreaming Pinky, on Twitter. Well, not the Dreaming Pinky. It's just Dreaming Pinky on Twitter. I do art and stuff, like um, says I here said. And I'm actually getting back on my drive to doing more art. I primarily do OC and fandom-based art. I was just kind of finishing a sketch with one of my characters and a Pokemon that suited her personality. And I just, I, I just want to share my OCs with everybody. That's yeah. all I want to do. Yeah. And uh, if uh, if anybody can't, if anybody can't find it, I'll leave links in the description below to this video so that you could be able to check that out if you really like. And uh, so yeah, this has been the Art Sozo with Dream, and uh, we hope you guys really enjoyed this talk on Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Uh, oh, what just are your... Pokemon in general? <laughs> just Pokemon in general. Uh, out of curiosity, like uh, anybody out there who watches this, if it's the present or the future, what are your thoughts on Pokemon? And uh, leave a comment in the in description below. And uh, if you like more of this, please tell me. I will be down to I will be down to talk more about this. Hopefully, uh, if this really goes well, and I, I actually do have the drive to do it, I'm thinking about uh, talking about more stuff like uh, I don't know, like our JRPGs or even Persona. You know, stuff like that but yeah um thank you all so much for watching and taking your time to listen in and i uh, hope you all take care peace bye bye